I want one of each, what can I say? Now it's been a little while and you might be thinking, Kat, why are you talking about corsets again? Number one, because I'm doing a PhD on them, so I'm legit just always low-key thinking about them. But number two, and more relevant here, is because corsets are often the starting point of most historical costumes. You can often get away with making one chemise that will carry you across most time periods, but corsets are different, particularly the ones in the 19th century, where close-fitting clothing was worn. The corset was a structural layer that could shape the body to the fashionable silhouette by manipulating the curves and ratios between the bust, the hip, and the waist. As such, today we are tackling a corset style I have not made before, the 1860s. And the reason for this is that I am making a new 1860s ensemble from inside out. I am hopefully, fingers crossed, attending my first historically costumed event next year, which is a Victorian ball, and they, each year they change from a different decade, and next year's is the 1860s, so I've decided to make a whole costume for it. I've made one 1860s dress before, but it was one of my very first sewing attempts, and though I loved it, it no longer fit me, and I'm really glad it's gone to a good home. Before we dig into a little bit about the history of the 1860s corset, I want to address one of the most intimidating aspects of corset making, the need for accurate sewing. When you're stitching all those seams, being as accurate as possible is so important to keep the fit of your corset, because every single deviation, every millimeter adds up. Um, and also when you're stitching boning channels to make sure that they're straight, they're on grain, that kind of thing. This has only become increasingly harder with the shift in clocks and the virtual disappearance of daylight in England. And so I wanted to mention today's sponsor and my solution to this problem, Serious Readers, the makers of Serious Lights. I have my very own Serious Light here from the high definition range, which if you've watched any video on this channel in the past 11 months or so, it has absolutely featured it. It's carried me through the darkest of winters last year and it will again this year. Serious lights use daylight wavelength technology, which replicates the daylight spectrum as closely as technically possible, and it makes my indoor sewing space much more soothing and realistic and manageable. All Serious lights are built in the UK and come with a five-year warranty, and as you can see, I've had mine for nearly a year with no issues. They are currently running a great offer where you can use the code SR493 SR493 for £100 off a high-definition light plus free delivery. You can follow the link in the description below to check them out and you can also see how the light behaves through the rest of the video because I'm mostly able to do sewing at night time now which is after 4 p.m so I hope this light has been a lifesaver. So a little research about 1860s corsets. I am modeling mine after a particular extant from the VNA Museum, a gorgeous gorgeous example that I think has fascinated historical costumers for ages. I think it's one of those really iconic pieces that when you think of a corset this might come to mind. It's made of a beautiful soft blue silk with contrasting flossing and a light cream. 1860s corsets are on the tail end of a transitional period in corsets where the typical 1830s and 1840s style of stays, often all in one piece or two pieces, give way to a corset with more seams and panels and gussets and all kinds of things, allowing to achieve a curvier and more rounded shape. One of my favourite aspects of these courses is that they are often allow for a generous hip spring and or cut quite short. I'm short-waisted, I have quite a large hip spring, so it's something that is quite short up is very comfortable for the modern day-to-day -day wear as well. This is because the skirt style of the 1860s was very full and volume started immediately below the waist, which meant corsets didn't need to shape the hip area and it wasn't visible beneath the crinolines and skirts. I suspect this makes 1860s corsets quite comfortable, or at least so for my body shape and my needs. For this, I searched around for a pattern since I always prefer to have a starting point rather than fully drafting my own, and I think that's fine. This is a PSA, if you're doing historical costuming, you don't need to fully draft your, your costumes if you don't want to. You can absolutely just buy a pattern and start with, off with it, make it exactly as it is. You do you. I have to be in a particular mood to want to draft, and I wasn't in a particular mood to draft. So instead, I shopped around and I had two contenders, but I decided to go with the red threaded 1860s pattern, as I've used a couple of their patterns before and I really like them. This pattern has a very similar layout to the extant I was taking inspiration from, with the exception of the back hip gore. The other pattern I was considering actually featured the back hip gore, so I think I'd thought more about it. I might have just merged the two patterns, uh, but as it was, I went ahead with the red threaded one. I thought it was alright. <laughs> that compromise was okay with me. I altered the boning to mimic the extant and I made two mock-ups. The first was a little small so I recut some pieces in a larger size 
And then the only other major alteration I did was to take, take in the bust gussets a little bit because I'm, I have quite a small bust compared to my hip spring. So sometimes it looks really uneven. I'm very much a pear shape. Um, and so I often have to take in the, the bust gussets a little bit. I just did this by like a quarter an inch on either side, on one, on one of the sides of the gussets so that it just fit a bit better. The alternative is if you want to keep the proportions of the pattern is that you can pad out your corset a little bit as well. So here's a quick, a quick look at my materials for this project. I will be using this cotton drill, um, slash twill. This is the finest cotton twill I've ever seen in my life. And you can see it's super lightweight. But as you can see, it's still like, it's really dense and it's beautiful. So I think this will work really well as my inner layer, my strength layer. And then as my outer fabric, I have purchased one meter of this, which is a blue silk taffeta that is also really lightweight, but really densely woven. Um, it's a little duller, I think, than a lot of higher priced silk taffetas, but I didn't want to spend a lot of money, so here we are. This is the thing is that this, this drill as well was very, very expensive, but I only got a meter of it because I was only doing one corset. Well, I think out of one meter you can get two corsets or maybe even more. But this is what I'll be using, um, and so now I'm just going to prep them. But I also wanted to show you, I ripped this from the bigger cut by uh, tearing it across the um, grain, and this is their cut from the shop at the top. Can you see the difference? How off grain that is? <laughs> oh well, let's get to cutting. I was super careful with positioning my corset pieces according to the appropriate grain line. The front piece, for example, is cut off grain on the bias, which I think is super interesting. This was done across a variety of different corset models throughout the 19th century, and I'd like to do some more investigation as to why and how. So the first step for this um, corset that I'm making is going to be a technique called roll pitting. If you haven't heard of it before, the purpose of the technique is to take the two layers of fabric that we cut, so the outer fabric, in this case my silk, and the inner structure of fabric, um, which I'm going to call the interlining, which is the, the stronger trill, uh, twill deal, drill. Oh my gosh, my English today and to make them into one. Now, you might have seen me use this technique, which is technically called flatlining or interlining um, before on the channel, and I usually do it flat. However, for a corset, because it's very curvy and it has to go over the body in a very curved manner, roll pinning is meant to prevent wrinkles on the outside, and the purpose of it is so that the outer fabric is actually slightly eased into the inner fabric and there's a little bit more outer fabric so that when it wraps around the body, because when you go out around an outer curve you need more fabric. So that's the purpose of it, is to add a little bit more fabric in a really gentle and eased way. And so you can see here that I've done one of the bust gussets. Um, one is just flat with nothing, so if you were to do it flat it would look like this. But with roll pitting, I kind of just smushed it down and you can't quite see, but it's already got like a bit of a gentle curve in it. Can you see how it kind of stands away? Um, I've only used this technique I think once or twice before, so I'm obviously not an expert, but I'm really curious to see how this looks at the end, because at the moment you can see there's a lot of air bubbles in here. So. I'm just going to show you how uh, it's done on these little corsets and then I've got all the whole panels, all the panels of the corset to do, so let's get into that. So the first step for this is that you need to do this over a curve. You can do this over like your mannequin, your dress form, a pillow, <laughs> a firm towel. I'm going to be using my tailor's hat, which is shaped like this. And then the first thing you have to think about is where this piece is going on the body and kind of mimic that. So for this, I tried doing it on the flat here first and I thought this wasn't curved enough. So then I found that this curve here is quite nice for the bust. So 
all I do is I'm going to remove this pin was just there to keep the two pieces loosely together. I've just got a really thin needle because I'm, I think this silk um, damages quite easily. And then I'm just going to do one row of large loose basting stitches going straight down the middle of the gusset. And this is from the right side of the fabric because I want this um, fabric to extend over the inner fabric. So it needs to be on the outside. I have also lost my thimble, so please don't judge me because I haven't been able to find it. And then what you do is you're also going to baste around the edges. And this is the roll pinning bit. So you can see that I cut my outer fabric with a bit of extra seam allowance. Um, and that's because so it needs a little bit extra fabric to roll over. So I'm just going to very gently sort of curve it inwards just a little bit. I don't have a very dramatic bust so this doesn't need to have a very big curve. You've just added like a very gentle curve onto it, the fabric, without anything else except hand stitching. So I'm gonna put on my Dimension 20 and do this for the next few hours. It was now time to move on to machine sewing and in the fading daylight I set up my light and got on to sewing boning channels. Now something I hadn't mentioned is that the V&A corset seems to have been completely hand sewn. You can really zoom in and look at the gorgeous hand stitching. While I do enjoy hand stitching, I wasn't mentally prepared to hand sew boning channels for this project so I experimented a little with some silk thread and found out something super cool. You typically meant to top stitch boning channels from the right side from the outside of the corset, but on autopilot I had transferred all my markings to the inside of the corset. Out of sheer laziness, <laughs> I decided to see if I could load up my bobbin thread with some silk twist thread. And lo and behold, with a normal thread on the top and the twisted silk on the bottom and some fiddling with the tension of the machine, this machine sewing creates this effect which actually looks really textured and reminiscent of the hand stitching. I love it. So I loaded up my bobbin and got to stitching. Okay, so the next step is actually to put the gussets in the bust, and that's because it's much easier to put the gussets in when this is flat. So the first things I did was that I marked the seam allowance on the gusset, which in this case is 3 8 of an inch, and I also stay stitched. This will just help these bias edges keep from stretching. And then I also stay stitched around the slit that I'm going to cut, which you can kind of see here. 
I stitch it on either side of both slits on both sides of the front and that's just to help the fabric keep together because now the big step is actually to cut through these slits so that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to do it with small scissors because this, these fabrics aren't very thick and this way I can really precisely control exactly what I'm cutting. Then you slightly roll inwards those cut edges and place the gusset underneath, matching the folded edge of the gusset to the marked seam allowance. This is my preferred method of inserting gussets. I've used it loads in the past. It's, it's pretty, it's a little fiddly, but once you get the whole of it, it goes all right. The gussets are then basted and top stitched into place, in my case, very shoddily. I also had to swap to using the silk thread on the top and weirdly that didn't work as well as in the bobbin. Then it was a matter of pinning all the seams together and sewing them. Okay, so the next step is actually a pretty important one and it's a little tricky so I thought I'd talk to you about it as always. So this is the hip core piece, whatever you want to call it. This is the front, this is the back. So this needs to go in before the center back bit goes. So you can see it's the curve there. This is a tricky curve. Um, it's manageable because the seam allowance is quite narrow. For this pattern, it's I think three eighths. And if you baste it, it'll be all right. So there's two points to match, which are marked. And I'm just gonna pin it carefully, baste, and see how that goes. I added the eyelets to the back panel before it was stitched on, so this is way easier. And then I seamed it to the corset. And that's pretty much the main construction. I finished some of the seams by hand, by flat felling them or hand over casting, which is where you use a dense whip stitch over the raw edge. This helps prevent the fabric from fraying, and since this will never be machine washed, I wasn't too concerned. On to the finishing. This corset actually came together pretty simply because it's got minimal panels and it's actually very sparsely boned, even with my additions. I cut strips from my silk to bind the top and bottom edge of my corset. After zooming in on the V&A photos, I noticed that the binding was on grain. This wasn't a unusual in the 19th century, though less appropriate for very, very curvy corsets as it might wrinkle. But it's much more fabric efficient, so I was very happy to cut them on grain. Then they're sewn to the right side, ironed to the inside, and the raw edge is folded under and finished by hand. Once I'd done the bottom, I could add the boning. I'm using two types, my favorites for this corset, a seven millimeter wide synthetic whalebone and a seven millimeter wide flat steel. The flat steel goes on either side of the eyelets only. I, I'm not sure about the extant, the boning on the extant, because obviously I haven't seen it in person, uh, but it was very common to only put steel on the either side of the back, especially towards the end of the 19th century. The rest of the boning is cut to size, filed smooth, and put into the channels. Now there is one very noticeable missing element, the flossing. Unfortunately, I didn't have time to finish this before flying off on holiday, but I'm packing the corset with me and hoping to finish it there. If I manage to do it before the video goes live, I'll add a little clip at the end. If not, stay tuned on here and Instagram for the final shots. And for now, here is a look at the corset and some thoughts on the fit and design.
Okay, so I just wanted to give you some thoughts on this design. I'm pretty happy with this corset. So a couple of my goals for this was to make it really lightweight, which it is. And I wanted it to be, you know, just a plain day-to-day -day corset. It wasn't meant to create a dramatic shape. It was just meant to give me the 1860s silhouette and to support the body. That was it, and also to be pretty, but you know, I haven't gotten to the flossing yet, so it will be, I swear. But I think this is pretty great. So you can see that it has a gap, but it's not a massive gap. It's between one and two inches, inches which is about right. Um, I can pull it a little bit tighter if I want a more dramatic silhouette. It won't do a lot of shaping because that's not the purpose of this. Um, but what my favorite thing about it is really this comfortable hip spring. So there's no bones whatsoever over this, the hip because it doesn't really mean to shape it. It just means to like support it and continue this line. So this is, you know, really nice. And obviously with other corset models, you can put hip spring in so that it doesn't squeeze your hips. But I have such a difference between my waist and my hips that sometimes I can't quite get it right. And I think this model really facilitates that. So yeah, I'm pretty happy with it. I can't wait to make it a little bit prettier. It is super comfortable, but it still provides me pretty decent support, especially because it's got this, like, it's the steel bones at the back and that I've increased the boning at the front as well. So it's pretty, it's pretty solid, but still being really lightweight. So I'm pretty happy with it. I pray I get to get to the flossing before this video goes out. If not, thank you so much for watching this video. A reminder that you can use the code SR493 on screen here to get £100 off your Serious Light High Definition and free delivery. So I hope you have a better lit rest of your winter and stay, stick along for this 1860s journey.